Well, good morning, church, and welcome to worship this morning for Multnomah Presbyterian Church. So glad that you're able to join us today. And uh, really, this has been uh, such an such an unusual weekend in our, in our area with the extreme heat. So we hope that you are staying safe, staying well, and staying staying cool. And uh, we're grateful for this opportunity to be able to come together for for worship virtually. I want to especially welcome those of you who might be newer to our community, or if you happen to fi find this service on YouTube, we are so glad that you are that you are here today. And we'd love to, uh, to connect with you further. So um, if you would like to get further connected with the life of our church, please feel free to reach out to us, reach out to our office. We would love to, to get to know you and get better acquainted with you. And now as we uh, enter into this time of, of worship, um, I now just want to just want to pray over us and just ask that uh, that God's spirit would uh, would inhabit this uh, this call and that uh, and that we would be drawn more more fully and more deeply into the love of Jesus. So let's uh, let's pray together, friends. Uh, God, we thank you so much for bringing us together today. And we do in this moment say a prayer for those who, who are not safe this, this weekend. Pray for those who are deeply impacted by this heat in our area and just ask that your, your blessing would be upon them and that by your grace and by your mercy that they, you would help them get the help and the assistance that they need. God, we thank you that you are Lord and that you are Lord of, of all, that you are Lord of this church, that you are Lord of our lives. So God, we ask today that we would be just drawn closer to you. God, that is what we want, is that we want to come into your presence. So we ask, Father, that you would meet us here in this service, and that you would speak into our hearts um, your promises, these words that we are longing to hear. So God, we are here this morning to meet with you. And so we invite you now to, to come in and have your way with this service and have your way with us, Father. God, we pray all of this, Lord, in the strong and powerful name of Jesus, our Lord, who loves us. Amen.
the Father, for the glory of the Son, in the power of the Spirit, now in faith we come. We are gathered in your presence as the people of As we sing, we lift up your name, O God, you are worthy of our praise. So great in power and glory us in grace, so high and holy, the mighty three in one. In your name we come. We will call upon your mercy as we celebrate your grace and will bring our joys and troubles as we seek your face, we will share the peace you've given as we feast upon your word and you make us into light for all the world. We lift up your name, O oh God, you are worthy of our praise, so praise. So high and holy, the mighty three in one, in your name we come. Open our lips, open our lips, and we shall declare your praises. Paul explains love to the church. Paul wrote a book in the Bible. It was really a letter to a church in Corinth. Paul was a man who got to know Jesus' love and decided to share that love with others, helping churches all over. But when Paul was helping churches, he discovered that just because people had Jesus' love didn't mean they act like Jesus and that people in the churches were fighting. So he realized he needed to teach them about God's love. So he told them things about love, like love is patient. He meant patient, like when we care for something or someone, we have to be patient and let them grow and change. Like a gardener waiting for vegetables. We can't always make people do the things we want them to. We have to wait and let them grow. The church needs to be a place where people don't have to have all the answers because they're learning and growing too, so they can ask questions. He also said things like, love is not selfish. He meant that we have to share what we have with others and not just hoard it for ourselves. 
And the church needs to be a place where we make space for everyone to enjoy learning about God. He also said that love is always there. No matter where we go, whether up to the sea or out in space, God's love will always be there for us. And the church needs to be a place where people can always know and feel the love of God too. Paul wanted to remind the church in Corinth that God is a loving God, and that means that his house, the church, should be a place of love too. Friends, let's, uh, let's pray together as we go before the word of God today. Gracious God, we, we humble ourselves before you now as we come before your, your holy and precious word. I ask that you would speak to us now in this time, that you would speak to us loud and clear, that you would teach us more about your kingdom, that you would show us who you are, God, that we might know you, that we might love you more. And I ask, Father God, that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing and and acceptable in, in your sight. For Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, this morning we are wrapping up our current worship series that we have been in for the last several weeks that I titled Coffee Mug Verses, Reading the Bible in 
context. And what we've been doing, in case you're just joining us for the first time in this series, that we've been looking at some of the more famous, some of the more popular verses of scripture, those verses that we see all of the time. We've been taking a deeper look at them, reading them in context, seeking God's wisdom, and really seeking to open ourselves to what God is saying through these very familiar texts. And also, I do hope that you will worship with us in July as well, because starting next week on the 4th of July, we're starting a new series. We'll be spending four weeks in the book of Jonah. So I'm really looking forward to how God uses the book of Jonah to bless us and also to challenge us. But today, uh, we close out this series by looking at another passage that we've heard a number of times, and it's 1 Corinthians 13, also known as the love chapter, one that we've heard uh, countless times at weddings, and it's just really a marvelous passage of scripture, and I'm, I'm excited to dig into it with you today. Um, so I want to take us there now. I'm going to be reading for us 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 8. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can open to, to that passage, and I'll also put the words up here on the screen for us. So friends, I invite you now to hear God's word to you this day. Paul writes, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen. So friends, the author of 1 Corinthians, who is the Apostle Paul, makes it abundantly clear in this chapter. He leaves nothing to chance makes it clear that it's all about love, that if we miss that, we miss everything. And it's important for us to know some things about the church in Corinth, this church that Paul is writing to, because this church is a, a, a church that, that Paul himself founded, and it's a church that's really missing the mark here. They're, this church is not really loving each other all that well. So in, in some sense, 1 Corinthians 13 it represents the antithesis to what was being demonstrated by the Corinthian church, because this church, they were not patient, they were not kind, they were incredibly self-seeking, they were incredibly proud, and that's precisely the reason why Paul is writing this letter. Paul is writing to a divided community, a community that has lost its way. And the Corinthians, you know, the thing about them is that their theology was really solid, right? It was really sound. But there was a disconnect, right, between what they believed and what they practiced. And all throughout the letter, Paul is addressing all of the various sin issues that the Corinthian church is dealing with. It was things like there were lawsuits going on between believers. There was sexual immorality. There were some in the church that were um, asserting themselves as being superior to other people. There were uh, the church was divided along economic lines between rich and poor, between the haves and the have-nots. And one of the major divisions in the Corinthian church was on the subject of spiritual gifts. Because some in the church believed that certain spiritual gifts were better than others. There was this perspective that there were sort of varsity level spiritual gifts, mainly tongues and healing and prophecy and things of that nature, the supernatural gifts. And in the Corinthian community, those with these supernatural gifts were held in really high regard, while others were just treated as less than. And this is what Paul is speaking to in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This chapter, this, this love chapter, has everything to do with the role of spiritual gifts in the life of God's church. And this is where I want to really 
zero. And this is where I want us to focus today. I want to speak to you today about spiritual gifts. But let's begin by just giving a biblical definition of spiritual gifts. I think this is a really good place for us to start. And I actually want to put this definition up on the screen for us because I think it's really important. And this comes from an author, Tim Keller. And uh, he gives this really nice definition of spiritual gifts. He writes, the spiritual gifts are abilities God gives us to meet the needs of others in Christ's name. That's a really succinct definition of spiritual gifts. They're God-given abilities distributed to the people of God for the purposes of building up the body of Christ. But interestingly enough, in today's church, there is a major debate going on relative to the role of spiritual gifts. And the debate is between two points of view. It's between cessationism and I was continuationism. That was always hard for me to say, but cessationism and continuationism. Uh, this this is a real thing. So stay with me here. There are, like I said, there are, you know, there are two sides to this debate. There are those who describe themselves as cessationist, right? Those who believe that the supernatural gifts of the spirit, tongues and healing and prophecy, cessationists believe that these gifts do not exist for the church of today. Right, cessationists believe that those particular gifts were given to the early church, to those first disciples of Jesus, but they're not available for the church of today. And many Protestant and evangelical traditions fall into this camp. And as you may imagine, on the other side of that coin, you have continuationists, right, who believe the exact opposite. Right? They believe that the Holy Spirit continues to impart the gifts of tongues and healing and prophecy for the building up of the church of Jesus Christ. And Pentecostal charismatic churches tend to land here. But I share this with you for this reason. I share this with you to highlight the reality that the people of God are still divided over this. We are still arguing about spiritual gifts. And it's really unfortunate because Paul is so clear here in 1 Corinthians that if we're dividing ourselves along these lines, that if we're dividing ourselves over spiritual gifts, we are missing the point because the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to the church to build up the body in love, to meet the needs of others in the name of Jesus. Friends, this teaching on spiritual gifts is so critical for us right now. This is one that we can't afford to miss. This is so crucial to our common life together as a family of faith. And again, I'm going to reference Tim Keller here because I think he points out something that's really important. He points out two problems that we often encounter when we seek to exercise our spiritual gifts. He calls these two problems gift projection and gift cop-out gift projection and gift cop-out. And I want to briefly unpack these two things. Uh, first, we have gift projection, right, which has to do with a sense of guilt among Christians, a sense of guilt and having this mentality that we're not as gifted as other people might be, right? We may feel as though we have a lesser set of gifts, kind of a junior varsity set of gifts, gifts that aren't as important, or, or maybe we don't even we're not even sure if we have spiritual gifts at all. There was a study that was done years ago by the Barna Group, which is a re great research organization, and they surveyed Christians on spiritual gifts, and they found that 30% of Christians didn't even believe that they had a spiritual gift. So this is gift pro projection, a feeling that many in the church have, that they're not gifted or maybe not as gifted as others in the church. But there's also something uh, that's referred to as gift cop out. And, and I think this is really something that we need to pay attention to as well, because I hear this sometimes in the church. I will hear people say, that's not my gift. And I'm sure some of us listening to this have maybe said that before. I know I have in response to something. That's not my gift. And, and sometimes, sometimes that's valid, right? Because I will say, to you that if you have a, a leaky faucet in your house, don't, don't call me because that's not my gift. <laughs> but really, in my estimation, it's not my gift. I think it sometimes equate to kind of a polite Christian way of saying, yeah, I don't want to do that. 
right? In some ways, we we use this as uh, and we use this in some sense to get us off the hook for doing something that we don't like or something that we're just not comfortable doing. For example, there are some who are uniquely uniquely gifted by God to be evangelists. Right? There are some that have this amazing and unique ability to communicate the gospel to those outside of the faith. And for you, that may not be your gift, but it doesn't mean that you're off the hook for ever having to talk about your faith. Right? So that's kind of an example of gift cop-out. And you know, Moses tried, tried this strategy, this cop-out strategy in Exodus chapter 3. Same thing with Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Same thing with Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1. The Bible is littered with stories of individuals, individuals who were called by God, and they tried to say no. They tried to say, yeah, Lord, that's, that's not my gift. So friends, if we take the narrative of scripture seriously, the chances are that God will surprise us and God will call upon us to use our gifts in some ways that will take us beyond our places of comfort and convenience. Friends, this teaching on spiritual gifts is so critical for us as a church in this moment that we are in. When I was 16 years old, I, I played my first year of varsity baseball, and I was so excited, right, because I was finally on the varsity team, and I got to wear the good uniforms instead of those tattered hand-me-downs that they gave us in JV. Uh, but anyway, since I was new to the team, kind of low on the pecking order, there were several games in which I didn't really play. Right? And I remember there was always this moment before every game where the coach would come in the dugout and post the lineup card and everyone would go over and look. And if you saw your name on the list, then you were playing, you were in the game. And if not, you were sitting the bench or you were riding the pine. And nobody really liked sitting the bench because really you don't feel all that useful. Right? The, there comes this perspective or when it comes to the game, there are those who are playing Right? There are those who are actually participating, and then there are some, there are others who are just kind of sitting back and watching. And oftentimes it can really seem that way in the life of the church. And I think this is a perspective that we sometimes have, that there are two groups within the church, right? There are those who, who minister, and then there are those who are ministered to. But God's word tells us that nothing could be further from the truth. So listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to put this up on the screen for us. This is Paul's words from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4. He writes that there are many different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. And all these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So church, let me, let me be clear. All of us are called to a form of ministry. We are all called to ministry. All of us have a shared mission, a common calling to use our God-given abilities to, to meet the needs of others in Jesus' name. Yes, and this is the fact is you have been supernaturally gifted by the Holy Spirit for the purposes of building up the body of Christ. I want to repeat that just so we're all on the same page. You have been supernaturally gifted by the Spirit for the purposes of building up the body of Christ, for that is what we are. We are the body of Christ, and every part matters. Every gift matters. And I know this can seem like a lot to take in, and perhaps there are some of us who are hearing this who, who just aren't really sure where to start. You've heard me say that you are supernaturally gifted, but you're not sure what to do with that or what step to take or how you're even supposed to know really what your spiritual gift might be. And the, the scriptures clearly state that God distributes spiritual gifts to every believer, but there's not really a process outlined for how we discover our own gift 
giftedness and how we discover what our gifts really are. And I know there are lots and lots of spiritual gifts, tests and inventories and um, assessments, and maybe you've done something like that over the course of your time in the church. It's kind of like taking a spiritual Myers-Briggs test, but, <clears throat> but, re <clears throat> but really the most effective way, the most effective way to determine our own spiritual gifts, church, and hear this, the most effective way to, to determine this is just to serve people. Right? That's how our spiritual gifts are revealed. Not necessarily by asking, what is my gift? But by asking a more important question, which is, who is in need? You see, that's the important question when it comes to determining our own spiritual gifts. Who is in need? And if we commit ourselves to that mentality, if we lean into that posture of servanthood, then the Spirit will, will reveal our gifts to us. God will reveal our gifts. And this was really the, the issue that the Corinthians were having is that they were so focused on the gifts and which ones they had and who had the right ones. And they missed the important question, which is who is in need? Who is in need of prayer? Who's in need of encouragement? Who's in need of, of, of physical and financial help? Who is in need of companionship? Who is in need of hope? If we ask these questions, and if we ask those questions, the, the Lord will reveal our, our gifts to us. I'm certain of that. And friends, Friends, this is a critical moment in the life of our church. Right now, this season that we're in, this is such a critical season for our church, for MPC. Because the fact is the church has, in my estimation, has never been more necessary than it is right now when we are dealing with an ongoing crisis, a pandemic, global um, crisis and disruption. It's a moment when our culture continues to be devastated by division and disuni disunity. This is a moment where the world, where our culture, where our community is looking for something good. And in a, in a broken and fearful world, in a broken and fearful world, the Bible calls us to love because love always hopes. It always perseveres. And if we are going to make a kingdom impact in this world, if we are going to impact our community for the kingdom of God, it is going to take all of us. It is going to take all of our gifts. It's going to take us using our God-given abilities to meet the needs of others in the name of Jesus. That's what it's going to take if we are truly going to impact our world with the gospel of Jesus. And I pray that that would be our mindset. That when we gather, that when we do life together, that we would lean into that servanthood mentality, that our focus would not be on when we come to worship, but that our focus would not be trying to get our own needs met, but that our mentality would be to continually seek the Holy Spirit on how we can bless, how we can build up this community in love because love, church, love never fails. And I want to close today with a quote that I love. I want to close with these words from Teresa of Avila, who's a 16th century nun in the Catholic church. So friends, hear these words. These words are so inspiring. She wrote, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now, but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, amen. Thank you, Ray. So it's such a good thing it is for us to be together today, to be reminded of the good news of God's love for us and his love for this world. My friends, if you, uh, if we, we have heard uh, today about just the amazing ways that God pours gifts into the life of his church. And part of our worship each week is actually giving back to God some of what God has, has graciously given to us. So if you would like to worship God today through the giving of tithes and offerings, you may always do so um, at our website at moldpresschurch.org. And now friends, if you would receive this blessing, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace today and forevermore in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let all God's people say, amen.